Hi everyone, welcome to the ninth consecutive Internet Party Anti-Spy Bill event. Today I am so pleased and so excited to have one of my personal heroes here with us. Her name is Cynthia McKinney and for many years she was almost the sole voice speaking truth to power from inside the United States House of Representatives. She was originally with the Democrat pa Democratic Party and then eventually in 2008 stood for the US presidential election as the candidate for the Green Party. Cynthia, say hi to New Zealand and to the world. Hi, New Zealand and the world. <laughs> <laughs> it is so awesome to have you be here. I have seen, I've watched everything, all your interviews, your amazing documentary called American Blackout for years. Yes. I'd love so much for you to share the, the wealth of experience that you have. Could you tell us a bit about how it was that you ended up in politics? Completely an accident. Um, it was not supposed to be. When I was in, um, well, you know, the academic world as a very, very young person, I was kind of nerdy, right? And nerdy people are rarely really also popular. But my school was so small that I was allowed to be a little bit nerdy and a little bit popular too. So um, as a result of that, I knew what the popular kids were doing, it's just that I didn't participate at all. So that was uh, really good for me. And um, so the nerdiness is what got me into trouble when I eventually became an elected official because it was that nerdiness that I don't know, you know, got, well, it just got me into trouble because I was never satisfied. I was always asking questions If they would give, give me a, a, well, you know, this is blue, then I would ask them, okay, well then why is it blue and why did you choose blue, blah, 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 right? And so that's what got me into trouble. So at first I was in the Georgia legislature along with my dad. I come from a political family. So, um, I, uh, I was having a baby in Jamaica and my dad was having beef with his colleague in the Georgia House of Representatives. And so he said, I'm gonna get you. And he told her that and then he just signed my name up. To, uh, <laughs> he signed my name up to run for office. Well, of course I was in Jamaica having a baby so I didn't do very well, but I did well enough when the marriage was, you know, sort of on the rocks, I said, well, let me go back home and see what I can do there. And that's exactly what I did. And so I ran for the Georgia House of Representatives. I won. I was in the Georgia House with my dad, which was like a new phenomenon for the United States, father-daughter legislative team. And uh, then I ran for Congress and I won again. Wasn't supposed to happen. This was never, ever supposed to happen. I wasn't supposed to run for office on the local level or the state level. I wasn't supposed to run for Congress. It was always for somebody else. But in, in the end, it ended up being me. And so that's my story. <laughs> Amazing. And one thing that really comes through in the documentary American Blackout is the amount of community organizing that was behind the success of your campaigns. You had this amazing network of this groundswell of local people that really were very personally invested in you being their representative. And I can only imagine how much work went into developing that network. Well, you could say maybe a lot of anti-work <laughs> because basically what happened was when I was in the Georgia House of Representatives, I did two things that gained a lot of notoriety for me and made the powers that be absolutely hate me, but made the people love me. One of those things was um, the when George Herbert Walker Bush decided to bomb Iraq. I couldn't go to sleep that night. I stayed up and I watched what appeared to be something really beautiful. I mean, you know, you've got this news guy now talking about how beautiful the weapons were. Um, 
it appeared to be really beautiful. It appeared to be like fireworks, but I knew that underneath what appeared to be beautiful that looked just like fireworks was people being killed. So that's why I couldn't go to sleep. Sorry to interrupt you. And You're talking about the shock and awe campaign, correct? Yes, that's exactly right. So I, I couldn't go to sleep. I stayed up all night and I wrote how I felt. So the next morning I went to the, the legislature, we were in session and I asked to speak, I asked the speaker to allow me to speak on a point of personal privilege. And I just sort of let George Bush have it. And I said, George Bush ought to be ashamed of himself. And when I got to that point, all my colleagues got up and walked out on me. And it was like, well, you know, I'm just saying how, how I felt. Everybody got up and walked out and I ended up speaking to an empty chamber. But it wasn't an empty chamber because people, it made the news, people listened and they agreed. It was from that experience that I was asked, why don't you run for Congress? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I can't run for Congress because um, my seat is supposed to be eliminated after four years. And I was in so many different uh, PhD programs and I was, you know, in PhD program and I'm trying to finish, but the politics always got in the way. And so I said, no, 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 I can't do it. Well, it also turned out that I was on the reapportionment committee. And so our responsibility was to provide for the state of Georgia, a reapportionment that allowed a Congress, a, de a congressional delegation to be elected that looked like the people in Georgia, which before, was all white and all male, right? <laughs> and so we said, okay, well, we're gonna integrate it. And um, that was also quite controversial. Got me into a lot of trouble. And so then, but like, again, people love me for being controversial, for having the guts to just say, okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't like that, <laughs> you know? And uh, we have to do time. something else. So. It, it was like, um, and then my dad, my dad gave me the best advice because what he told me is, Cynthia, they put their pants on just like you do. So I wasn't supposed to be afraid of them. I wasn't supposed to think that they were better than me. I was supposed to ask questions and expect answers. And so that's the way I carried myself. Well, that was like unheard of. <laughs> so, um, ah, so I got into trouble and I got promoted up to the Congress. Now, when I got into Congress though, I got into trouble again. And you could say I became a whistleblower just like all of the other whistleblowers that are a part of the internet party. <laughs> so you're speaking truth to power is what resonated with the general public and, and also the international public, because I'm not sure if you get to see this so much, but you have a huge international fan base. There are people from all around the world who have been deeply moved by what you've done. But from what you were just telling me about how your colleagues w actually walked out of the chamber, I think that demonstrates the extent to which both the Democratic Party and the Republicans are pro-war parties. Correct. That's right. And, yes. and, 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 and so this is what, um, in the first time that the election was stolen from me, my mother always reminds me that they didn't, uh, you didn't lose. The people still support you, but it's just that they stole the election. Okay. So the first time I had two elections stolen, right? And the first time the election was stolen from me, I said that the Republicans wanted to beat me more than the Democrats wanted to keep me. And so basically what had happened was the Democratic Party had left the values that I had, certainly, as an elected official, but 
maybe the Democratic Party never had the values that I had. Maybe I was the one that was completely unaware of how retrograde the Democratic Party really is. So when I started to speak out against war and I expected that the national leadership of the Democratic Party would support my position because after all, they're not the party for injustice. They're not the party for war and destruction and death and killing. They're not that party. Well, what they proved to me is that they are that party. So the Democrats basically walked away from me. I didn't leave them, but maybe it was a recognition on my part that they weren't what I expected them to be. So in 2007, in front of the Pentagon, I declared my independence from all of the national leadership, Democrat and Republican, that it caused the United States to become the warmongering party of death and destruction that it is now. Incredible. And then how did you get from there to running for the, as the US presidential candidate for the Green Party in 2008? Hmm. So let's see. Well, um, I. So you felt that the Green Party did did represent the anti-war voice, correct? Yes, I think so. I think so that the 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 Green Party, the Green Party is a very very good. It has good political positions, and so it's not the perfect party, and there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of improvement, but just in terms of the platform of the Green Party, I don't think it can be beaten. The Green Party is a wonderful party comprised of wonderful individuals. It's just extremely small and it's got the deck stacked against it so that um, it's hard to, what, become successful? Uh, as a political party with power. Right, so we see the same thing happening in the US election, particularly driven by the media that we did in New Zealand, which is where you have these two major behemoth parties. I like to call them the Coke versus Pepsi because one is red, one is blue, but they've got the same poison inside them. And we have exactly the same thing in New Zealand. We have what we call the National Party, which is our blue party, our Republican Party, Mm -hmm. and the Labour Party, which is our red party. But they both support war. They both support the utter ruination and devastation of the planet. They both support corporate interests and big money. And neither of them do anything whatsoever about creating real systemic change or fairly representing the average person. Um, And I, again, we also have the Green Party in New Zealand, which is the probably the most ethical party in terms of creating sustainable long-term um, solutions for our planet and for our earth. But the media in New Zealand tells people the race is between national and labor. You must vote red or blue. You must, you know, to stop the blue guys getting in, you must vote red or to stop or vice versa. Right. And it's the same thing in the U.S. as people believe they have to vote Clinton to stop Trump. But both Clinton and Trump, this is a class war and they're both from the same class. Exactly. Yes, they are. And so therein lies the problem. So how are we going to get to real change, transformational change? How do we make that happen? Uh, One of the ways that we... What I teach my students is that uh, we cannot, how can I say, we cannot allow um, we cannot circumscribe the possibilities for change that we are able to make. So that means that we cannot deny ourselves opportunities that may not be popular, may not be um, 
uh, immediate, but that might uh, tend to transform us from where we are to where we're trying to go. So we, we uh, how can I say, how, so that we have to um, keep in mind that our goal is transformational change. And if that means Democrat, Republican, we're not gonna get there. What we have to understand is that the Democrats are the Republicans, the Republicans are the Democrats, demo, demo, oh, what do they say? Demo Republicans or something like that? Republicrats. Yeah. yeah, the Republicrats. Yeah, they're the same. So, and how do I know that? From my practical experience, 2006, Democrats have the majority in the Congress. And they're saying, okay, you elect us and we're going to make sure that there's no more war. We're not gonna finance any more war. 2006, the war party, which happens to be the Democrats, recruit someone to run against me in the Democratic primary. Why? Because I'm anti-war and the person that they recruit is pro-war. So comes the first vote to cast about um, funding of the war, um, the Iraq war or not. As it ends up, the legislation to fund the war passed with exactly the 218 number of votes. Because of the yes vote at 218, it meant that the Iraq war was funded. And guess what? I did not win that election. Had I been there, I would have voted no. And the legislation to finance the Iraq war would have failed. Wow, unbelievable. It passed with exactly the number of votes required. So this is why I say that the, Dem and it was Democrats, it was Rahm Emanuel who recruited a Democrat to run against me so that our country could be thrust into the Iraq war again. Again, this was what after, Democrats did. after Bush had already stood on the aircraft carrier and said, mission successful. Yes. <laughs> yeah, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished, and the mission, yeah. And the mission was accomplished because the United States is still at war. The United States is still dropping bombs. And I'm just so angry, so outraged all the time. I carry the anger, anger and the outrage with me because, you know, I'm ready at any moment. And I, I see the many women that are going through the travel security and they put their hands up like that. And I'm saying, how come nobody is protesting? I, you know, I protest all the time. I don't go through the Chertoff machine. I don't want to make Michael Chertoff any more wealthy than he already is. So I don't go through that machine. Now they're talking about after Las Vegas, putting those Chertoff machines, Michael Chertoff, putting those machines in all of the casinos, in all hotels. I mean, you know, it's just another round of corruption. And so in order for um, a small country to become certified, then they have to buy all of that equipment that has nothing to do with September 11th. And that's the thing. So you're standing up here, you know, like this, and, you know, letting all of your body parts be x-rayed for somebody to, well, photograph, for somebody to pass around after you left. And, um, and of course, the dose of radiation, you're already getting on an airplane, you don't need more radiation, but the little dose of radi radiation there and the, the um, 
transportation safety workers are being exposed to the radiation, never mind about them, who cares about them? We care about them, but that's less important than putting people through this fear mill. And so it's so accepted. And I'm just wondering, I ask myself every time, why am I the only one who's saying, no, give me a massage. I'll take the full body massage, right? You can, and then now what they've done is they've become more aggressive. So they explain to you, uh, we're going to go all the way up until we feel something. So if, you know, so they got to feel something and then we're going to do everything. We're going to use the back of our hand. Well, anyway, so anyway, so yeah, every time I travel, I get ready for the full body massage. And I just say to myself, okay, I'm going to take this massage, but this is my way of saying, no, I resist. That's disgusting, isn't it? It's unbelievable. It's totally disgusting. It's totally dis disgusting. But what's more disgusting to me is the, the paucity of the people who are actively resisting. Resistance means more than just um, clicking around on the internet. After all, George W. Bush said he clicked around. So we need to do a little bit more that, that Bush does uh, to oppose the things that Bush stood for and stands for and the legacy of the Bush administration. So we have to do a little bit more than click around. At the same time though, we have to know who it is that we're following too. So, you know, uh, we're all leaders in our own right and we influence others. So we have to make sure that those that we are following because of those who follow us are worthy of our followership. And that's where we get into the innocent people who are affected, say like a Charlottesville, where you've got the, uh, they, they weren't the Klan. I'm from the South, so I know about the Klan, right? But these were like people who wanted to the white nationalists, they call them. The, 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 the white, yeah, white nationalists. Okay, so the white nationalists are out there. Um, and then you've got the anti-white nationalists, I guess, the anti-fa. But if they're financed by George Soros, um, then, you know, that's something we need to know. And so you've got a segment of the population that's out there being represent, well, you've got a segment of the population being represented ostensibly by a smaller segment of the population, but really that doesn't represent them at all. And that's the thing. So we've got these two groups over here that are providing us political theater. And that basically is what it is. They're fighting each other, but they don't represent anyone other than themselves. So now how can we move away from the political theater into real change, the transformational kind of change, a whole system change, second order change, what the academics call it, second order change. How can we move, or um, people like uh, George Bush, would say regime change. Well, then we need, we in the United States, and I would then assume those five I countries, we mm -hmm. all need the transformational change that is second order change that is regime change. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we need a transformation of our values. That's the kind of change that we need down to the level of our values. And that reminds me of what I teach my children, what I drill into my children all the time, which is people over money, people over money. People yes. are more important than money. People are not replaceable. People are special and, and must be respected and protected. Uh, that's, 
very important to me to choose people over money and that's people anywhere whether it's in Iraq or whether it's in New Zealand or whether it's in the United States we must choose people over money look I heard what you're just saying then about uh, we need to be careful of which leaders we follow and that instantly made me think of who did win the 2008 election which was Obama and the world the world cried tears of joy when he was elected because there was going to be no more war there was going to be no more Guantanamo. There was going to be, yeah. you know, he was going to take on the banks and the global economic crisis and he was for the people and he was the community organiser and he was the constitutional lawyer. And what happened? Nothing. He became just like all the rest of them, but that's why, you know, I ran in 2008. So I understood that it was going to be more of the same because I know the Democratic Party I totally know the Democratic Party. So if the Democratic Party at that time was not ready to change, then what the nominal leader, nominal leader of the Democratic Party was going to represent no change. So it was face change, not regime change. People were confused. People confused the new face, the different face with regime change, values change, transformational change, but it wasn't to be. And all one had to do was to look at the background of Barack Obama. Who was his mom? Who was his dad? Or who we think his dad is? Uh, who was his grandmom? Who was his granddad? Who did they work for? Who were they associated with? What was the work of his stepfather? Once you answer those questions, you know very clearly that this is not going to be about change. This is going to be about more of the same or maybe worse. And as Glenn Ford at Black Agenda Report was fond of saying, Barack Obama was not the lesser of two evils. He was, how did he put it? He was the, um, uh, he was more evil because he facilitated evil. Right. You understand? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. He made made it palatable. Yes, that's right. So he was worse. He was absolutely worse. He was the salesperson, the salesperson. Right. So, you know, I happen to be over in Paris with Annie Machon. You know Annie Machon? Yeah, from, I do. Uh, I uh, from yes, okay. So uh, we were together when um, Barack Obama was announced as the Nobel Prize winner. And, you know, it's like, we couldn't believe it, right? We're over there for a 911 event, 911 truth event. And Barack Obama uh, hadn't done anything except get elected and continue and and turn his back on justice for the George W. Bush administration people who facilitated the wars, the death, the destruction, the killing, uh, the lying to the people of the U.S., to the taxpayers 935 times, all of that, just, oh, no, we're not going to look backwards. We're going to look forward. (laughs) And then reading from behind, you know, I wonder what kind of leading that was from behind. But um, nonetheless, it was horrible. And now what has happened? The people who are the real Trump believers, they're making the same excuses for Trump that the Barack Obama believers made for the eight years of Barack Obama. is you know, at some point I say, well, you know, it would have been really wonderful for me to have been in the Congress so I could have voiced my opposition. And then when I think about it, that it's so hard when people don't have eyes to see. It's so hard to show them everything that they need to know for them to inculcate what they need to know when they can't see. 
because it requires study, right? Like when you first talked about how you got into politics, you said I was a bit of a nerd. I did the reading, I did the homework. And that's what has you self-educated outside of the traditional approved curriculum. You went beyond just what you were meant to learn and you learned yeah. about the, the reality, the, the, the reality behind politics. And that process, it, it takes, you know, reading thousands and thousands of pages, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages, be it digital or in books, to begin to get that level of understanding. And if you don't have the passion to do so in the first place, or if you have motivation, motiv um, motivating factors to not learn, to believe what the media says, to take for granted what the politician says to you. It's possible yeah. to remain completely asleep for a very long time. That's true. And, and so September 11th woke up a lot of people. Um, I would suspect that the sloppiness around the events in Las Vegas will wake up more people. The murder of President Kennedy woke up a lot of people and those people really laid a very firm foundation for the truth movement because they taught us really how to search for the truth, how to demand the truth, how to remain skeptical at all times of uh, any government narrative that seems to answer all of the questions. And I'm so lucky that I had Dr. Peter Dale Scott serve on my dissertation committee. And he's the one that coined the phrase deep state and uh, analyzed deep politics, deep events and the deep state. And so uh, when Charlie Hebdo happened, then I wrote a chapter in Kevin Barrett's book, Doctor, Kevin Barrett's book, uh, Je ne suis pas, oh, well, the name of mine was Je ne suis pas Charlie. I'm not Charlie. And um, so what I did was I used the model that's provided by Dr. Peter Dale Scott of how you, what are the steps that you go to to determine whether or not this is a deep state event or a deep event reflecting deep politics or might this be the real thing so i did that with charlie hebdo and so now people have got the hang of how to do this and you've got all of these truth researchers now with from las vegas who are pointing out you know were there drills well check there were drills was there uh stock fraud uh, check yeah there was stock fraud was there uh very um, immediately ready uh, narrative that explained everything. Yeah, there, there, there was that. So you go down, uh, Peter Dale Scott has like five or six different criteria that you use and you check off and you find out, wow, Las Vegas has most of them. We haven't had the insurance fraud yet, but we had the stock fraud. So, um, you know, I can't say exactly what happened in Las Vegas, the people who were there know better than me, but it certainly has all the hallmarks of things that need to be investigated by a truth, truth community because the presence of these checkpoints that um, check off against state events. Right. And uh, for me, my big waking up moment, I call it these events that you're talking about, like the Kennedy assassination and 9-11, etc. These are the glitch in the matrix events, right? Like the matrix is this veneer of reality produced by the media and politicians and even by the military. Um, for me, the glitch in the matrix was when I was seeing the in first person and through the live streams, the Occupy events spiral around the world. And I was turning on my TV and there was not a word about it and I was looking in the newspapers and there was not a word about it and I was watching um, thousands of people march to one police plaza in New York City to the headquarters of the NYPD and shutting the place down and then I'm looking at the biggest newspapers in New Zealand and biggest news shows not a word about it and that was the the breaking point for me because I understood 
if they have completely omitted this, this is history. If they've omitted this history, what else have they omitted? What else didn't yeah. I see on TV? What else didn't I read in the newspaper? And that was when I realized if I couldn't trust the media, I had to be the media. I had to go yeah. and do oh, people. Beautiful. Yeah, that is, that's why I became a journalist. Beautiful. And I mean, all the time, people, they think I became a journalist, like, so I could have my name on a byline. Or so. It had nothing to do with that. It was because I was seeing things that my citizenry needed to know about and needed to read about and hear about. And my media was not doing a damn thing to inform them. And so it was this, this urgency, this necessity that, I, I mean, I said back in 2011, if we cannot trust these corporate services, uh, corporates to provide these critical services to the people, we must do it ourselves. We must yes. step up and become the media. And that, that's what drove me, you know, for years. And so Occupy was this huge, it was this massive empowering breakthrough that that people can come together and provide for ourselves not just media but feed ourselves house ourselves yes. you know, even have like we even created like these um little organic like educational centers and like medical tents and like all the critical infrastructure of a society we were emulating yes. ourselves and we're doing it with no government funding, no corporate backing, no nothing, just out of necessity and willingness to meet that need ourselves. That's right. For me, that was just the defining moment. That was my big wake up. And it, as you said before about people who are still asleep, the evidence of that is that it was Obama's police forces and his fusion centers and his intelligence agencies and his FBI that smashed the occupations to pieces. And yet one year later, he was re-elected. That's right. That's one right. year later. Let me, let me ask you something here because you say that the Occupy movement was your sort of wake up moment. And um, I think in the uh, academic literature, we call that the disorienting dilemma. When you expected to be told and informed, informed by your local media, and it, it wasn't there. It wasn't there in any media, actually. So, but then that experience was so empowering for you. So what I want to ask you is those local, how can I say, those local mm, Occupy communities, they actually worked, didn't they? Yes, absolutely. They fed thousands of people a day. We housed, the homeless in my city were no longer homeless. They had a community, they had people who cared about them. We, and, and everybody worked, there was no unemployment. Everybody in the occupation worked, whether it was cleaning a toilet or peeling some potatoes or welcoming people at the welcome tent or doing independent media. Everyone worked. There was no, everyone had the access to education, the access to food and to housing and to community and social needs. And they all had work. Unemployment was obliterated. Well, now here's the thing. And, and you know, I'm just exploring this with you because my son is an anarchist. And this is exactly the kind of society that he would love to create one day. He, you know, he loves these intentional communities where people willingly come together, they grow their own food, they live together. You know, it's a, uh, Venezuela is uh, experimenting with these, uh, they're called quilombos. And they're basically a recreation of when the when the slaves would escape the, from the, uh, the clutches of the slave holders, they, were, they would run into the mountains and they would be, they're called maroons. So the maroons had these cities that are kind of called like, they're called Columbos, but they're like, they run like Occupy. Right. And, so now Venezuela, uncertain about its future because of US interference, the people have decided that they are going to organize themselves 
if they don't have a government that they can count on, if they don't have a government that is friendly to them, then they will organize themselves and they will become their government. It's wonderful. It Isn't that wonderful? So we had this big sign at Occupy. I think it was a replication of one that was at Occupy Wall Street. And it said, give what you don't need, take what you need. And so what we were told and what we did, I certainly did, was to go back to our houses and to look through every cupboard and every drawer and to, yes. find, and to find the things that had been sitting there for years that we'd never used, that we're never going to use, that we don't need for anything. Pile them all together, bring them to the occupation and that someone will need and use every single one of those items. And so that's what we did. I was like going through my garage, like all that my storage unit, like all this, the, and found mountains of stuff that I had absolutely no use for whatsoever. Going through my cupboard and finding all the canned food that I hadn't used because I didn't like it or couldn't even cook a recipe with it, brought everything <laughs> to the Occupy. And we had just literally these mountains of stuff that everybody had brought together and pulled together. And from that, we were able to equip the entire occupation. It was an incredible. That's fabulous. And, and like my son, what my son did was he would have um, zero dollar days. He, he went to law school. So during law school, he would have these zero dollar days where he would do exactly what you just said. Tell everybody, bring whatever it is that you don't need, bring it. And then, uh, so they would exchange things um, and everyone walked away with something that they wanted. And there was not a, there was zero dollars exchanged. Yeah, I finally learned about waste as well. I learned about the waste that exists in capitalism because people yes. go to dumpster dive for food. And here I am, I have this mental image of like this dirty, filthy dumpster with germs on everything and it being all disgusting and then pulling out like one apple with holes in it or something. And they came yeah. back with like crates of completely unopened, perfectly packaged, never touched, clean, um, like huge packets of bacon and things that, you know, like expensive yeah. food items, like thousands of dollars, like in unopened boxes. And I'm just sitting there going, are you kidding me? This is what is thrown out. And sure enough, I discovered that like millions yeah. of dollars a day, you know, of food in, in New Zealand, I'm sure more than millions in America, is just thrown out, sent to the rubbish tip to fill the tips. It's, a, it's more than enough to feed every hungry person in the country. And it's being locked up in dumpsters and sent off to the tip. And that was actually what led to Internet Party had a policy, this election that we put forward, where we would force the supermarkets to deliver the excess food stock directly to the food banks and then to allow yeah. people to come and collect it so that everyone had access to food. There are solutions like this that don't cost us any money. We don't have to put the burden yeah. on the taxpayers. We can actually we can actually have the, I mean, and even the corporations would save money because they wouldn't have to pay the tipping fees and the transport fees and the, everything else. And I just didn't understand how much waste is involved in capitalism. Needless. So me, yes. And so let me ask you, so now did that actually happen that the, uh, the grocery stores or whatever actually gave the food to the food banks? So in France and a couple of other countries around the world, this um, policy has already been implemented. They're already doing it, which is where we took the um, idea from, the initiative from. Mm -hmm. um, Internet Party, unfortunately, Internet Party did not get the 5% required in order to be representative okay. in Parliament. So we weren't mm -hmm. able to, but we think that by publish, publicizing and pushing these policies, that eventually the government will be forced to adopt them because policies we put forward in 2014 that the media lambasted us and ridiculed us over are already being copied by the sitting government. Wow. So we, we, we discover that when we put it forward and it's brand new and no one's heard of it, there's like the shock reaction, like, no, we couldn't do that. No, that's a crazy yeah. idea. But as the years go by, those ideas get co-opted by the existing power structure and eventually we're able to affect change just by having had a voice. Yes, that's right. And that's why it's so important for everyone to raise their voice. You have to raise your voice, join the conversation. As I tell my students, there's a conversation that's been going on for hundreds of years, right? It was going on before you, 
it'll be going on after you. But while you are here, it's important that you participate in that conversation. Absolutely. Um, just yeah. one last thing I really wanted to talk to you about. And that's that yeah. uh, one of the things internet, I mean, internet parties actually never made any statement in reference to 9-11. But one of the ways that we get denigrated is that these nameless, faceless trolls will say, oh, you're a bunch of 9-11 truthers, you're blah, blah, blah. So I thought to myself, well, you know, there's probably not, there's very few people uh, that would know more about the real truth of 9-11 than Cynthia McKinney. So let's reward the trolls by, talk, by talking about some of the undeniable facts related to 9-11. So I know that you worked directly with families of the victims. I would love you to just spend a few minutes telling us about what you learned about 9-11, what the serious concerns around that event are. Well, you know, uh, I was in the Congress at that time, and we were given talking points. And the talking points said that we were hit or targeted or attacked because we're free. And if we deviated from the talking points, we were supposed to deviate from the talking points. There was no real explanation uh, for how what we, you know, we all know what we saw, but we don't exactly know how it happened. So I was asking, how did it happen? I actually ended up writing, I began by, well, this is what got me into trouble because I realized that when there is a transportation accident or something like that happens, that the National Transportation Safety Board kicks into action. They can subpoena records. They can do everything. They can force design changes, they can do whatever it takes in order to make to ensure um, transportation safety. And that didn't happen. That didn't happen. You've got four airliners that are hijacked. Uh, the Pentagon itself that's charged with power projection around the planet, and yet it couldn't even protect itself. And we were never given an explanation for how that happened, nor were we given a credible investigation. So I held a, uh, it ended up being like eight hours, a congressional briefing. And we had the, the family, the victim families there, we had CIA agents, we had lawyers, academicians, we had whistleblowers, national security whistleblowers, Sabelle Edmonds was there, um, Wayne Matson, whom you might know was a part of it, as well as um, Mike Rupert was part of it. And so we just asked questions and uh, had a discussion, but even that information wasn't included. This, we had it on the anniversary of the publication of the um, 911 fairy tale. You mean the, the report, correct? The, the report, The official yeah. report, right. Yeah, Which the famously left out a number of, of issues, particularly around, I believe, the financing of some of the, the terrorists that were involved? Well, you know, there was the, uh, we go down the, the, the checklist. So, for example, what my professor, Peter Dale Scott, found was that there was use of the, the White House communications uh, system. Now, that White House communication system, nobody really knows that it exists, but... It's four o'clock. Sorry about that. Dick Cheney was using the White House communication system. When you go... So there were gaps in the known uh, conversations that were had and the timeline because there were conversations that were taking place over in this communication system where that was like off grid. 
And so that was going on. There's the Norm Mineta situation. There's the Able Danger situation. Um, Kurt Weldon was the member of Congress who found out about Kurt Weld uh, about uh, Able Danger and the fact that you, you, like the Valerie Plain situation was that Valerie Plain was following people, tracking uh, nuclear proliferation. And so she was tracking people covertly who were engaged in treasonous, <laughs> treasonous uh, behavior. And so Able Danger was a similar thing. Well, Kurt Weldon ended up getting, getting kicked out of the Congress because he said he didn't care. He was going to get to the bottom of September 11th because the Able Danger operation had already identified. So they were actually tracking people who were tracking the so-called hijackers. And uh, I was in that briefing when uh, Kurt Weldon found out about Able Danger. So uh, there's been a lot of, um, how can I say, some controversy around, it was, Lieutenant, it was the testimony of Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer. But then I noticed that on this most recent issue, um, it's Anthony Schaefer's name appearing with the the PNAC guys, the uh, Center for, you know, those guys. So it's sort of like maybe he's switched sides, but that doesn't negate the fact that the United States was well aware, certain aspects of the United States, of the administration, were well aware of what was going on and somehow um, it happened anyway. And this so is what Colleen Rowley, this is uh, what FBI whistleblower Colleen Rowley also said, which is that the FBI was aware of these guys, was tracking these guys, did know what was going on with these guys, and nothing was done. Yes, that's right. And now, Abel Danger was not even from the FBI. So this is another, this is from the Pentagon. So this is another arm of the United States government that's aware of what's going on. So um, clearly the people of the United States and the people of the world deserve to know what happened, how it happened, and who did it. They deserve to know that. Uh, we have not. The Europeans followed the Americans. Now this is what I've been told that uh, by a member of the European Parliament at the time, who said that the Americans went over, called a NATO meeting and said, um, we have the proof, we know who did it, but we can't tell you. And on that basis alone, NATO joined the US in its global fight against the countries that have been totally destroyed um, with Iraq and the ones that are in line to be destroyed like Iran and Russia. And if they can't co-opt China, then China will be on the list as well. But now, you know, I'm a sane person and, or as uh, the same progressive, Debbie Lusignan, she calls herself the same progressive. I'm a same progressive. And so I know that the United, the people of the United States and the people of the world don't need any more wars. And the last thing we Absolutely. need is war against Russia and China. The last thing we need is war against Iran. The last thing we need is more war. But there are some people who are more than ready to engage in war. Now, what we need is some courage from the Europeans. When the, when the Americans went to the Europeans and invoked the collective security from NATO, 
the Europeans should have said, well, we need to see the evidence. The five eyes need to say, okay, you're going to be one eye without us if we don't see some evidence. You know, there's got to be some courage. And so at the end of the day, maybe the courage has to start with each one of us. We got to demonstrate the courage. And that's why internet party is so critical. Got to demonstrate that you can speak up and suffer. Like, you know, I, t I told my students today, I said, I'm suffering. I'm suffering. I've been punished. I've been punished. I'm suffering. But I'm not suffering. If anything, what I show is that it's possible to speak up. It's possible to stand up. It's possible to speak your values, to live your values and survive. The fact that there is such a price that comes with it, and I say this sitting here literally in exile in Moscow, Russia with my kids because yeah. I, I cannot even live safely in my own country anymore and speak the truth that I do. It is necessary that we do it. And the hardships that we face for doing it are evidence of the how important this truth is. That's why we are targeted for it. If what we were saying had no relevance, had no significance, the state would not even waste their time or their resources on targeting us. They target us because they know this is significant. They know it is the truth and they know that it resonates with people. So I completely agree with you. And also what convinced me personally of exactly how evil and malicious the deep state is, was mm -hmm. seeing the extent and experiencing the extent of that targeting. So each malicious action that they took against whistleblowers, against activists, and against truth-speaking journalists was further evidence to me that they've got to go. That system yeah. has got to come down. That system that targets people for speaking truth is rotten to the core, and it's got to go. That's right. I love you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one last quick question for you, and that's because this whole series of events has come about because there are five pieces of legislation which have been passed in New Zealand in the last five years, which extend mm -hmm. the powers of the state to spy. One of the most egregious elements of that is that they have something now called domestic visual surveillance, where they have made it so that without a warrant, they can plant cameras inside your home and watch you inside your home and that is just the breaking point for us as i've said before they have legalized orwell like we it's not orwell is coming orwell is here it's happening right now and so this series of events has been about discussing these issues of state and private surveillance and the targeting of activists and journalists now i know from watching your documentary that you have been targeted, not just by your own country and, and the military industrial complex, but also it seems by other countries. In the documentary, you talk about being stalked by a, a strange Saudi Arabian guy. And you also did make reference to having been targeted by the Ku Klux Klan. I was wondering if you could just briefly tell, tell us about your personal experience of being persecuted for your political opinion. Yes, I've had two stalkers. And uh, that's not fun, believe me. Uh, one of them, both of them were reported to the police. One of them actually was in prison and um, had some high powered um, uh, uh, lawyer representing them though, oh, him, and, uh, but had all of the hallmarks of being a cut out intelligence operation, the identity, didn't exist prior to 1999. Um, so, you know, it was a made up identity. So that was one. And then uh, that the reenactment of that is in uh, American Blackout. And then the other one was someone who, both of them came from Texas, which is interesting. But, uh, and, and I'm in Georgia. So they came a long way to do whatever it was that they were trying to do. And um, so uh, th that was interesting that they came from Texas, one, 
But secondly, that um, I just didn't know if, if there was going to be some bodily harm done to me. So, uh, you know, you can never be too, too safe when you are um, taking these positions or taking these stands. And um, you always have to remain alert because anything could happen at any time. I, I, just for the record, and what I put in my book was, I'm not suicidal, <laughs> I'm not depressed, okay? So anything happened to me, it, you know, it's uh, definitely not because uh, I did it to myself or, uh, or whatever. <laughs> It's, a, it's tragic how many of us have had to make the same statements. I've also in the past done a Facebook post saying, I am not suicidal. I would never commit suicide. I'm not doing any drugs. Yes. I don't drink yes. alcohol. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable that we have to do that. Okay, um, we have a bunch of questions. I mean, the guys were just saying on social media before that there's been a flood of questions for you. So I just asked okay. Blake to come on now. Blake is actually, uh, he's the young, I believe, the youngest political candidate in New Zealand. He's only 20 years of age and he stood in this recent general election as a wow. candidate for the Internet Party. And interestingly, the media said nothing. Nothing. Hmm. We have the youngest political candidate in the country and the media were silent about him, unsurprisingly. Blake, can you well, join you know, us? Uh, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, Cynthia. You've got a minute. Oh, yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, I didn't get any media coverage in 2008 when I ran at all. And then uh, one journalist, journalist in quotation marks, contacted me, I was so excited, I got an interview, finally got an interview, National uh, Public Radio. I did the interview and basically my, uh, they called me back, before I could get back to the hotel, they were calling me to come back and redo the interview. Guess why? My, I gave the wrong answers. Oh, what? I gave the wrong answers. And so they could not air my interview because I gave the wrong answers. And so I had to go back and re-record. Re of course I didn't. And so there was no interview. <laughs> oh, that's unbelievable. Well, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's very believable, but it's also unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Blake. Hey. Hey, say hi to Cynthia and then take it away. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, Great. Cool to I have you on. You ask you, what did you learn? <laughs> Being the youngest candidate, what did you learn? What did you learn about the political system in New Zealand? I learned that they make it very hard to be a small party. Yes. to have any yeah they shut you out and yes. tell you that you're not going to yeah they sh they they tell you on the media there's all that there's a few small parties and they tell you that they won't get in because not enough people are going to vote for them and that makes even less people vote for them because they're scared their vote will be wasted yes 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 so uh, then we need a serious change in our political system. And, and so now what I'm teaching my students about is direct democracy. And uh, we've got this blockchain technology. I don't know, I had to learn all about it. But some people are really excited about blockchain technology because it can introduce, it's one way to introduce direct democracy. So uh, if you're familiar with that, you can uh, help to school me now and later. <laughs> yeah, um, so one of our things that we have that's quite unique is we have an online website um, where all of our members can go and they can tell us what, what policies they want 
and they oh. can discuss them and um, then eventually they can vote on whether they become one of our policies. Oh, that's excellent. And that's how the no spy bill came about. Is it? I'm not exactly, no. I think something like that. <laughs> the, anti, the anti spy bill is just a direct response to the, le the government legislation that has been uh, passed in New Zealand. Um, and oh. it's an attempt to create crowdsourced legislation. But our actual policies that we put forward, uh, we had um, a housing policy and, you know, we have educational policies, et cetera, et cetera, and the food policy, the food equality policy that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. the, all of these are policies that are suggested by the membership and then the membership helped to write those policies. And then they are voted on for adoption into our policy manifesto. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Now imagine we run a political party like that, we run a community like that, we run a country like that. Wow, that's my dream. Absolutely, and this is, <laughs> Cynthia, this is yet something else I'm always saying, which is you can vote on American Idol every Sunday night, but you only get one vote every four years as to right. who your government is, like something, something's not right here. That's right, that's right, and in fact, you know what? I was, uh, this is 2008. I'm in Washington State. I'm uh, in the parking lot of a grocery store campaigning, passing out flyers. And the gentleman said to me, inside there, I can choose from 200 different types of Oreo cookie. <laughs> but on election day, I can only yeah, That's right. That's right. You've got Tweedledee or Tweedledum. Which would you prefer? That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Blake, I'll let you go ahead and ask the question. Right. Um, first one. In your experience, do the Democrat and Republican establishment coordinate to prop each other up and support the same agenda? From my experience, the answer to that would be yes. The evidence for that most recently would be the 2016 presidential election where we had the serially criminal candidate, Hillary Clinton, who was determined to become the Democratic Party nominee, even if she had to cheat, lie, and steal in order to get it, which she did all of those, <laughs> and so ended up as a Democratic Party nominee. And then Republicans who are supposed to be, you know, they're supposed to be over there, they have their own political party. Well, establishment Republicans left the Republican Party and they supported Hillary. So um, that's when I think it just was very clear that there's an inside game and there's an outside game. And both the Democrats and the Republicans are accustomed to candidates being a part of the inside game. The fact that in 2008, you did not have this uh, sort of uh, bum rush out of the Democratic Party um, when uh, Barack Obama became the nominee should have indicated that uh, there was some uh, okay for this candidacy at the very highest levels of the deep state, of the US deep state. And so likewise, we know that Hillary Clinton was then, still is the representative of the deep state. And now we know that POTUS Trump is doing everything in his power to become the um, preferred candidate of the deep state too. Tibbs. Sorry, I didn't Sorry. get that. Was I muted? 
Um, the yeah. next one is from Angel Tibbs. And she says, how did hashtag unrig turn out? Well, hashtag unrig isn't over. Um, it's uh, actually only just begun. The, how can I say, there's a difficulty. And the difficulty is when people come together, then uh, there's differences in vision. And so what happens is that we have to allow people to pursue their vision. And uh, so in hashtag unrig, what we would like to do, or what I would like to do is to be able to pursue my vision without telling other people what their vision is. And so that's why uh, the power cell innovation has come in. And by the way, MailChimp, I wanted to send out my first, uh, we're looking for volunteers for the power cells. We wanna have people from all over the United States, every congressional district volunteer. We want every congressional district to be represented in the power cells. And so then what I've done is on my website, I've made available, which I can also give to you guys, the draft copy of what my vision is. So my vision for the power cells is that we will come together from the populist left to the populist right. We all will come together, sit down in the same room at the same table. And I guarantee that we will be able to work through our um, prejudices about each other because part of it is that we gotta make peace. We in the United States, we gotta make peace with each other. How in the world are we going to defeat the deep state if we're fighting each other? We gotta define who the deep state actually is. What's their agenda? What's, we got to define what's our agenda. And one thing from my reading of the COINTELPRO papers, I've read most of them. I've read many of the volumes of the Senator Frank Church committee reports that were produced about the excesses of US intelligence against the US population. And one of the things that is very clear in the reading of those documents is that what frightens the deep state more than anything else is me and you coming together. That's what they're afraid of. And therefore, that needs to be our urgency. And so the vision that I have of the power cells is that we will meet, right now what I'm doing, or supposed to be doing, is pulling the, together the volunteers. And so if there's anyone who wants to volunteer, and you know, the information at the end, we will give to those in the international community as well. So you might be able to utilize this. But basically I went for four years to a PhD program and this is an opportunity to actually utilize the knowledge that was generated during uh, those four years that we have from the behavioral sciences, we have procedures that are recognized as being efficacious that allow people to resolve their differences. And then once those differences are resolved, that then encourage them to work together to identify and then resolve the problems, their local problems that they're facing in their community. That's my vision for the power cells, that people will be empowered to work with people who are not like them, but who share a common concern. And through the sharing of the common concern are actually able to work together to resolve those concerns. Okay. 
And um, from independent outsider, how do we break the myth that smaller parties simply cannot win? That's tough because the, the, you know, candidate Trump said it, the system is rigged. And the system is rigged against small parties. So here again is where hashtag unrig comes in because as the system is rigged, we the people have also been rigged. The way we think, the great anti-apartheid leader Steve Biko said that the greatest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So if we believe, then in that manner, we also behave. So we've got to unbelieve what we've been told to believe. We've got to unrig ourselves and our even our belief system. Once we do that, and then, you know, I, I say uh, in my hashtag unrig vision statement that I will send to you, that um, we utilize appreciative inquiry. So even though we're different, we take a group and we turn that group into a team. And even though we're different, we use a particular type of positive research to appreciate the way other people allow us and encourage us to change. And we, you know, it was Netanyahu who said we can't make friends, we can't make peace with our friends. If you wanna make peace, you gotta talk to people who are different than you. You gotta sit down in the same room together. And so um, maybe at some point, the ability to fuse the smaller parties, maybe that is what it might take uh, so that there's a way in which to, mm, how can I say, um, to organize and mobilize all of the smaller parties for a common goal and a common ticket, maybe, I don't know. That's just something for us to crowdsource. <laughs> so that was the, I'm just gonna interrupt for a sec because that was the power of the Occupy movement was the 99% against the yes. 1%. And that yes. in Occupy, we were exposed to all different types of people with all different types of priorities and thoughts and agendas. Right. And, and that was the beauty and the power of it was the unity in, in New Zealand we say kotahitanga is an indigenous word for it. You, the unity of the people as a mass. And we had a very clearly defined enemy, which was not even the 1%, but the 0.001%. And what I see now is that somehow in the last six years, we've been dragged back to that divide and conquer where now the 99% is the 35% and the 45% and the 15% and the, the whatever yeah. else. And they are able to manage us and control us when we are divided like that. But when we were a cohesive mass of the 99%, it was very, very difficult for them to, which is why they blacked it out, because they, they had no idea initially how, how to deal with it and how to suppress it. The other point I'd just quickly make is what you were saying about Charlottesville. What I see is that in 2011 and, and 12 and 13, we were protesters against the state. And at the protests, it was a very clear definition of the people against the men in black, the militarized police forces. And these were the two sides. Now we see protesters versus protesters and the men in black on the side laughing, smiling. Yes. They are more than happy to sit there and watch different parts of the population attack and target each other. That serves the state. The state would much rather be the onlookers than be having to be in the confrontations. And so some, somehow we've got to remind people that our unity is our strength. 
you know, as they say, the divided we fall, you know, united we stand, divided we fall. It's exactly what we're seeing play out again. And I also went back and watched some of the documentaries about how the civil rights, the decline of the civil rights movement at the end of the 60s. And it was again pushed on racial lines. The African American activists were told to exclude the white activists. The everyone was pushed into their little pockets um, of resistance, and they were no longer a united force. But when they were a united force, they were a force to be reckoned with. And somehow we've got to get back to that. We've got to be clear that it is us against the state and not us against each other. That's right. And in fact, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference used to make bumper stickers. That's uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s organization. And the bumper sticker would say, let us turn to each other, not on each other. So we have to remember that. Another saying from the civil rights movement is that we have to keep our eyes on the prize. So let's keep our eyes on the war machine. The wonderful thing about the Occupy movement is that it gave us our language, the 99% against the one, right? And as you say, it's the zero, you know, the point zero zero one. But they gave us our language, they gave us a visual that we understood. Now, uh, Gilad Osman has written a book, his latest book is called Being in Time. And he talks about those who balkanize the population are the masters of divide and rule. And uh, it, even with my students, what I teach them is Paolo Freire. Paolo Freire gives us the mechanisms of oppression of which divide and rule is one. And he also gives us the tools for liberation so that we can free ourselves from these mechanisms of oppression. Unity for liberation is one of those tools for liberation. So the, the answer is very clear. What is less clear is the methodology. And that's why I remain committed to hashtag unrig and putting these power cells together. And hopefully by January, we will have a power cell representative in every congressional district in the United States. Hopefully we will do that so that in January or whenever it is that I'm able to break away and come and do the travel, that I will travel to these states or maybe we'll take a chunk of states at a time, but that I will do the travel to do the organizing, to do the one-on-one the, uh, -on -one coaching really um, so that we can take that group of disparate people and turn them in a, into a team that's working for their liberation, but even more um, uh, to the point, working to resolve the issues that confront them in their local communities. Fantastic, fantastic. Blake, have you got a last couple of questions? And then I think we need to let Sophia go. Okay. Um, from Winkle, he says, what do you think of the $80 billion increase in military spending and where do you think the money could be better spent? The United States has a terrible infrastructure problem. And now post Harvey, Irma, Jose, and Lee, we've got even more of an infrastructure problem. And let me just remind the audience that people in Flint, Michigan still don't have a water system that delivers clean, potable water to them, to that community, uh, in particular to the children. And more and more local jurisdictions are being given boil orders because the water is not clean. So we have infrastructure needs. We have a healthcare system. Now, you know, Obamacare is not healthcare. Obamacare is health insurance. Health insurance is not healthcare. Health insurance allows the insurance bureaucrat to get in between me and my doctor. 
And what the people of the United States need is health care. So we need health care, education. Somehow, probably because the system went overboard, the public education system went overboard, and the dissatisfaction level was so high that people, communities were talked into allowing privatization. And so now we've got privatized education system where the CEOs of these um, uh, uh, charter schools is what they're called, have yachts, they have airplanes, they're doing all kinds of things, you know, living high on the hog on public dollars. So that clearly is a mistake, but we still have an issue about high school dropouts. We have some communities where the dropout rate is, 50%. I mean, what kind of future are we preparing? So we've got so many needs. It was the Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, said that every dime spent for war and in the scientific endeavor for war toys, war machines, is a theft in a very real sense from people who are in need. That's what Dwight Eisenhower said. So the 80 billion or whatever it is he gave is too much. And um, the Pentagon budget is too much. The federal bureaucracy is too much. And uh, we need to I'm not going to say localize all of the dollars, but there, but the dollars need to be prioritized to impact communities that are in need. I completely agree with you, obviously. Um, also, uh, someone, I can't remember who it was, but someone was telling me about Dr. Martin Luther King who, Jr., who you've referenced several times today, that he was not just pro-civil rights. He was pro-civil rights, anti-war, and anti-capitalism. Yes. The abuses of capitalism. And yes. sometimes people forget, and especially in the current, um, you know, neo-Nazi versus Antifa argument, we, it's all contained, it's postured as being contained within the United States, but we had uh, anti-war activist David Swanson join us a few weeks ago, who's a lovely guy and a good friend of mine. Yes. And he, he explained to us very clearly that in fact, war is racism. War is racist. It is inherently racist and that you cannot separate these issues. It's not, you can't address racism without addressing war and you can't address war without addressing capitalism. And these things are in, inherently interwoven. And that, in, actually it must've been Swanson who, who said very clearly that the history, um, the memory even of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has been revised to limit it yes. to a narrow perspective but that actually he saw the full spectrum and spoke on the full spectrum of these problems. That's exactly right. And so the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the real Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is not the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of the 20th and 21st century. He's been sanitized. Now that he's dead, they've sanitized him, which is a practice, kill and then sanitize. And so that's what has happened. But you're absolutely right that it was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who proposed the Poor People's Campaign. The original Occupy movement, right? Would go to Washington, D.C. and stay there until you have convinced the Congress to enact a, an economic program that benefits everybody and not just the few. Yeah, that's, the, oh yeah, that was good. It's amazing too, when I went back and watched the documentaries of the protests in the 60s, hearing them speaking the same chants that we had at Occupy. And my first, my first thought was, oh, 
how did they know our chance? And then I clicked <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this is, it was, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, we, when you're a new activist, you assume that what, everything you're seeing is for the first time. And then eventually you realize this is generations of struggles. These charts are older than yeah. our grandparents, you know, yeah. and the tactic of occupation goes back hundreds of years. This is, that's right. As you say, that's it's, right. it's an ongoing struggle that is so much bigger than just that's ourselves right. or just our generation. The and still we struggle. That's right. And still we struggle. Every day we struggle. As I said when in a speech a long time ago when, uh, down in Malaysia, I said, I wake up every morning with resistance on my mind. What can I do today to resist more effectively than I resisted yesterday? I, oh gosh, you are giving, you are filling my spirit, honey. You really are filling my spirit because in the end, you know, is spiritual warfare. There's something that happens when people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, when we come together and then there's that aha moment. I get it. That's spiritual. And when we can achieve that, then we're unstoppable. We will win. So we've just got to get busy about mobilizing so that we can win. We will win. When we stand up, we do win. That's incredible for me to hear because um, the idea that I could inspire someone like you is just blows my mind, to be honest with you. Um, but I've got to pay homage as well. Um, you should know, Cynthia, that what I am is a reflection of you, of your teaching and of your speaking, because I have studied your work and been influenced by your work extensively. And also by the, the, the my other teachers, David Swanson is a teacher. Yes. All of these people, yes. Chris Hedges, who I certainly hope to one day have on this program, I've read everything he's written. I've watched all of his videos. And you know, there's this whole array of people and I've taken on and absorbed their messages and their life experiences. And I am just like a conglomerate of all of those with my own experiences you know, chucked in for good measure as well, and my own thoughts as well. So I know yeah. that when you are speaking and the work that you are doing, you have influenced people. I'm one of millions. I'm just one of millions. And you have influenced people like us. And I, I'm pleased that for you to have the, the feedback of, of our existence and, and our efforts as well also in turn inspires you. That's pretty special, very special. Well, thank you so much. And uh, yes, you do inspire me. And uh, so now I got to pay a little bit more attention. And then I need an explanation for the blockchain. So I'm expecting huh. the internet party, maybe you guys can come up with an explanation for me that I can understand and then be able to transmit to other people about how it's possible for us to have real democracy, e-democracy, direct democracy, through the blockchain. But I have one question about the blockchain and maybe we can talk about this later offline. And that is, who has the key to the back door? I don't, look, I'm not an expert on this at all. Uh, it's actually a, a new area of study for me, but it is an area that we are looking at pretty seriously mm -hmm. and highly. Now, my understanding is that the blockchain is a decentralized distributed network, which means you can have computers located all over the planet in different areas where they, you know, it would be impossible to penetrate all of those computers. And that what the blockchain is doing is cryptographically verifying transactions. Now, transactions don't have to just be money. It can be data of any kind. So one of the implementations we have been um, looking at is that in the future, stock movements will be verified by this method. So because the transactions are, are cryptographic, they cannot be, in theory, unless, you know, quantum computing, the NSA, like, happens. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know, really, the full extent of the ability of the state to interfere. But we assume at this point that the encryption does protect the transactions. And because no one can, because there's no central network to be controlled, then it, it becomes impossible to manipulate the verification of those transactions. And also the individual, you can never know which individual machine or computer is going to be verifying 
which individual transaction. So when I say it doesn't have to just be money, it can be data. That data might be someone's vote. So you could verify, in theory, you could verify people's votes cryptographically, protect them, make them private and encrypted, and never know exactly which machine it is that's gonna verify that vote. Now, there are people on this planet who know so much more than me about blockchain um, that can probably jump in in the comment section or reach out to us and tell me if I'm wrong, but that is my very basic understanding of the strength of the system and that, that that strength of it at an architectural level is why no single government has been, or banking or any other kind of economic power has been able to bring down Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or the blockchain because the technology itself is impervious to penetration. That's my okay. explanation. Okay, well then, uh, we'll see. I got to do some more research on it because, you know, everything has a back door. And so I'm just trying to figure, okay, you know, where's the back door? Who's got the key? Everything if has a back door that doesn't has a central have central system. Where there's a central system, there can be a back door. Um, so you have the, one of the strengths of open source software, which blockchain is a different thing. The open source software you can review the code and see where the holes are and see where the back doors are. But right. proprietary software, like the Facebooks, the Apples, the Googles, the Microsofts, the whoever, they and don't- And the voting system. systems in the US, the voting system is proprietary. Exactly. And that's how, that's why my mom says I, the election was stolen because we never got the election data, but that's a whole nother conversation. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, we, look, we just had an election where we sat monitoring the votes live and our vote count was going down by hundreds of votes. Like we were getting less votes as time went on rather than more votes. Like, yeah. We still don't know how that, how that can happen, that, that the vote count can go down instead of up in, in the real time reporting. But you're correct that these proprietary systems are vulnerable to exploit because the code bases aren't open. Um, we can't audit the code and see precisely what those are. We find out the hard way when a hack happens or a leak happens or something like that. Um, and that's why, you know, cryptography is one of the few tools that we have left to us to protect our data because in theory, it cannot be broken. Yeah, in theory. But so they just go into your system, they just go into your device. So they Correct. get into my laptop Correct. and they get into Correct. their system. So they can target you individually. Ab you're absolutely, I mean, they do this to my phone every single day. They can yeah. target your individual device. But why Snowden has made the point about encryption being so important is because it prevents mass surveillance. So they can't just go into everyone's device with one algorithm. They have to pick you off one by one. That takes a lot more time and resources for them to do. So we're raising the bar on the effort and the, the time resource that they have to put in in order to target us when we utilize encryption technologies. Well, I'm definitely uh, on board with all of that. I, I was on Gmail for so long, but I'm phasing out of that, got into Start Mail, Proton Mail, I'm not doing an, adver an advertising here, but uh, just, you know, that's where I went. And uh, there's Unseen. So there's so many platforms now and that we don't have to give them not even one click. So I'm working my way backwards so that I don't give not one click. <laughs> and slowly the entire internet itself is becoming encrypted through HTTPS, which we've talked about previously as well, which is a, a huge deal. It's amazing. Uh, Blake, do you have any more questions before we wrap it up? Yeah. Uh, Jenny Lynn asked and a couple of people like um, requested who won't be answered. So how do you believe we should affect change with the increasing totalitarian state and DHS takeover of the already rigged voting system? And maybe perhaps we just answered that with blockchain. 
Yes, and there's an entire community of people out there, particularly the young people who are so excited about Bitcoin and blockchain, who are looking at the kind of world that they can create, the kind of political systems that they can create um, utilizing this new technology. If this is a technology that is as innovative and is uh, liberating as is currently thought, then I will be the very first one in line. I will be staying you know, overnight to be the first one so that I can be a part of the change because the, the, you're at the, the, the questioner is absolutely right that the technology of the state is one that is strangling us. It's strangling our constitutional rights. It's strangling our human rights. And uh, so we've got, if we can come up with a technology that loosens the rope a little bit, that's fabulous. And that's what we all are trying to find. And I'm, I'm the cheerleader for the young people who are there doing that, uh, trying to, to loosen the grip of the totalitarian state. Actually, every state now is just about uh, that way. It's just uh, who are the states that promote freedom? Not very many. <laughs> I think you correctly made the tie too when you're discussing the five eyes because what we what we feel like in New Zealand and I know that Australians feel the same and, and certainly the Canadians too we've had a lot of dealings with Pirate Party Canada and others and they also feel that the USA is not so much a country anymore as USA Inc and USA Inc is you know, New Zealand is the 51st state and Australia is the 52nd state and Canada is the 53rd state. And we, we feel very much that no matter who is elected, perhaps even including ourselves in New Zealand, uh, you, until you can break the military collusion, the, the network that is the backbone of this transnational system of oppression, you, we can't even begin to retain our, or, or to regain our national identity and our national sovereignty. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Blake, are you done? Uh, we could have another one. <laughs> let's do, let's do one want. more and then we'll let Cynthia go. She promised us an hour and I've taken two, but hopefully <laughs> she will figure it out. Um. That was from East Slider asking, would a Labour Party work in the USA next cycle? What, the Labour Party? I didn't even get the question. Yeah, would a Labour Party work in the USA? Oh, would. Would, no. yeah, our funny accents. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, here's the question. Um, would a Labour Party work in the future, work in the US? That's the question. Would a Labour Party? But who's the Labour? Yes, because the Democratic Party is supposed to be the Labour Party. It is backed by the unions. My, my answer to that question would be the unions have become co-opted to big money. The unions, yes. yes. The unions yes. have co-opted by the same forces that are behind the militarism. Especially look at like the police unions. The police unions are basically full-time promotional outlets for the <laughs> weapons and defense manufacturers. They've forgotten what the word union actually means. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just uh, anyway, I, 
I think it's kind of hard to have a labor party if you don't have labor. So there would and need so to be representation the, at the at the level of the workers rather than yeah. corporates. Yes. Yes. But yeah, I think that I think personally that um, the Democratic Party was supposed to be the Labour Party, um, but it has betrayed the mission. Yeah. And then there's the you know sort of the practical aspect of uh, with automation taking the place of labor, that's a whole different problem. True. And then the outsourcing, the trade agreement, the right. so-called trade agreement. Right. right. The mining of labor at every turn. Yeah, very true. Very true. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap it up there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's like a dream come true for me to get to interview you. It's just amazing. Amazing to be sitting here with you as in person as we can be, but using the technology yeah. of the internet and bringing us together. So where are, you? where, where am I? are you? I'm currently in Moscow in Russia. You're in Moscow. Oh my I am gosh. In, I am in, <laughs> I'm in Moscow. So I'm, I was the first New Zealand journalist to apply for temporary asylum in Russia because I was really? yeah because I was really heavily persecuted in New Zealand um, for my activism over a number of years. Initially, it was just surveillance, and then it was home break-ins, and then things got really physical. There was you know tampering with my vehicles, and even in the last election cycle, attempts. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I was forced to leave my country, um, and that led me to seek asylum here. But the, upside, the, the yeah. upside of it all is that I have been able to continue my work um, and yeah. arguably, arguably with more impact even than before. So, um, you know, we pay a price, but yeah. we sleep easy at night, and that's it. You yeah. know, we stay true to our conscience. That's right. So um, I'm very lucky and very yeah. blessed to be able to work with people like yes. you and others. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. I'm really happy to be delivering your voice to New Zealanders specifically because I know how important it is for my countrymen to hear and countrywomen to hear your voice and your opinions and to know it's really important for us in New Zealand to know that there are American people who understand yeah who understand really what is going on and who have dedicated their lives to fighting against it. Because this isn't about anti-Americanism. This isn't right. about, about, you know, Americans being the enemy because Americans are not the enemy. This transnational system of control and of power right. is the enemy. And part right. of that is American and part of that is New Zealand. And part of that is many countries. The Five yeah. Eyes was expanded to become the 40 Eyes during the war in Afghanistan. There is yeah. over 100 countries that have been economically or politically corrupted or militarily corrupted by the United States, but yeah. not just by the United States, by the UK and the European backers as well. Yeah. So this is a global issue and there are citizens all around the world like yourself fighting to do something about it so thank you so much i want to give you a virtual hug <laughs> and say thank you. thank you so much for being here it was a real pleasure and you guys we will see you next week take care okay. and all the best from the internet party okay bye-bye thank you